Good morning guys and welcome back to another awesome episode of Learn Every Day. Um, so as you know last episode went up last Friday since then I've been in Amsterdam had an absolutely incredible incredible weekend over there such a beautiful city so many things to do um, actually cannot wait to get back there again in the next year sometime so if you're following my snapchat or not my snapchat sorry my Instagram you'll know the reason I was over there was to get a new tattoo um, and I'm absolutely blown away check that out obsessed absolutely love it um, but anyway I hope you enjoy today's episode um, what you'll notice is I'm playing around with the format a little bit I still don't think I've nailed it if I'm honest um, this is going to be a work in progress um, I'm not great at editing and again it's something I'm, I'm working on but in the meantime I still want to try and get content to you guys um, so if you prefer this format or you prefer the previous format that I had or if you think something in between would be useful Please, please let me know. In the meantime, enjoy. If you have any questions, comment below and I'll get back. Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Learn Every Day. So, we've got a really interesting paper for you guys today all about power development. Um, and it's called The Influence of Post-Activation Potentiation and Sprinting Performance in Professional Rugby Players. As always, I will link the paper below as well as providing the reference for that paper. So, a little bit of background information to, to help contextualize what we're going to discuss. So we know that muscular power is an important performance determining factor for many sports. This includes things that any sport that involves a lot of sprinting, any directional changes, such as rugby or any invasive based team sport, soccer, GA, also being examples of that. We also know that there's evidence suggesting that you may be able to improve power via resistance training and this may be beneficial to performance. For example, we've got some other literature or research that suggests a negative correlation between peak power output in split squats and traditional squats as well as sprint performance. So what that means is that um, we've seen a relationship whereby if you can increase your peak power in resistance training exercises, this may improve your sprint performance or decrease your time over five meters. Um, subsequently, we know that peak power output is an important performance determining factor in events like sprinting. So we want to increase peak power output to try and improve sprint ability. Throughout the literature, there's been a number of different strategies suggest to increase peak power output. And these have been investigated extensively and I will be discussing these at a later date. Um, most of these strategies involve manipulating or completing resistance training exercises at various percentages of your one rep max um, or at various tempos. As a side note here actually the optimal load bearing in mind what I just said that many people will manipulate load to increase peak power output is more than the optimal load is more than likely going to be a load that reflects the environment in which the observed perform in which the performance will actually take place. So if you're a sprinter, a load closest to your own body weight is probably going to be the load that's going to maximize performance or peak power output. Um, whereas if you're a rugby player who acts in collisions, you may have to increase the load to maximize peak power output. But that's a little bit off topic. Let's get back to the point here. So one of these other strategies that have been suggested to improve peak power output and what we're going to discuss today is contrast training. Now, what contra contrast training involves is the use of a heavy load called a preload followed by a lighter load lift. So a heavy loaded lift followed by a light load lift. And this has been shown to increase peak power output in athletes. So the athlete completes a heavy loaded lift subsequently followed by a lighter load lift and in that light load lift the peak power output has shown to increase. This is called post activation potentiation and what post activation potentiation does or is defined as is a short term enhancement of muscle function after a preload stimulus. The important aspect of this is that it's short term enhancement. So the increase in muscle function or power output in this case is, is only short term and is due to the preload stimulus. 
It should also be noted that the, the literature surrounding post-activation potentiation and the role that it plays in resistance training and improving power output um, is conflicting in nature and that's largely due to numerous methodological differences in the different studies. But let's focus on the paper that we're discussing today. So let's have a look at the methodologies. Or sorry, let's have a look at the previous research first. So from previous research, we know that optimal recovery time between the preload stimulus and the light load is about eight minutes. The light load being the load at which the peak power output is measured. So eight minutes between those two lifts appears to be what is optimal from a number of different sources um, to maximize peak power output during that light load. And this is during ballistic movements such as squat jumps, bench throws, where the load is lighter. The aim of this study, therefore, was to investigate the influence of post-activation potentiation on 5 meter and 10 meter sprint performance in pro rugby players. So although we have seen an increase in peak power output in ballistic movements due to post-activation potentiation, those ballistic movements being things like squat jumps or bench throws or any other ballistic version of a resistance training exercise, we have yet, or prior to this paper, had yet to be identified whether or not post-activation potentiation could actually be used to improve um, something performance in something a little bit more functional, such as sprinting, something that means something in the context of performance. So let's have a little look at the methodologies. First of all, there are 16 pro rugby players. And before we go any further, it should be noted that because this was completed on professional rugby players, results therefore are limited to athletes that are, number one, very highly trained, Number two, have a lot of experience with resistance training. And number three, are professional rugby players. Um, it should also be noted that all of these players were experienced with power training and had in fact just completed a power training phase um, that had included contrast training. So they have experience of this type of training method. Um, any results that we gather from this study, therefore, may not be appropriate or may not transfer across the populations that are not experienced in power training or have not prior to this completed any contrast training. So in terms of the experimental procedure, on visit one each player's three repetition max for the squat was measured. This was so that they could get an idea or an estimation of their one rep max and then set the percentages for the preload stimulus. The main experimental trial then took place the first thing that each athlete had to do was complete a 5 or 10 meter sprint test. This was the baseline sprint tests, so they had something as a comparison point. They then had a 20 minute rest, and this was followed by one preload set, which was a 3 reps at 91% of the estimated 1 rep max that was calculated via the 3 repetition max squat. After this preload set, 5 and 10 meter sprint time was again tested every 4 minutes up to and including 16 minutes. This means they were tested after 4 minutes, after 8 minutes, after 12 minutes and after 16 minutes. It should also be noted that each participant was asked to complete a standardized warm up or were provided with a standardized warm up that they completed. On a side note there was also 10 participants that completed the same 10 meter sprints every 4 minutes. Um, after the warm-up only in order to determine if there was an influence on the number of sprints as well as that warm-up specifically on sprint time as opposed to a sp special influence of the post-activation potentiation or contrast training. Okay, so let's have a look at the results from this study. First of all, when examining the group as a whole, so all each six or the 16 rugby players as one group, there was actually no effect of time. Now what this means is that subsequent to the statistical analysis, there appeared to be no effect of the post-activation post potentiation on the group as a whole. Now because prior research had indicated that response to post-activation potentiation type training is extremely individualized, this research group also decided to examine individual response to the contrast training. When they did this, they found that with regard to the 5 meter sprint, 47% of the athletes performed best after 8 minutes, in that after 8 minutes of recovery, post the preload conditioning or the preload lift, 
they performed their best sprint. 27% of them then performed their best at the 12 minutes, and the rest was split evenly over the 4 and 10 minute time points. With regard to the 10 meter sprint, we saw a similar pattern where 53% performed best again after 8 minutes. It should also be noted that all athletes displayed a significant decrease in their sprint performance after they had completed their best performance. Now there's a number of things I want to discuss here. One, or I suppose the first thing I want to discuss is the whole point of completing research is to examine the effect of a specific phenomena within a group so that you can make general recommendations in the wider context. Now, in this case, because the sample size was so small, that was not possible, and subsequently, the overall response displayed no significant effect. Hence, why they looked at the individual responses here. Secondly, secondly it is worth noting that although 47% and 53% performed their best 5 meter sprint and their best 10 meter sprint after 8 minutes. This also included another sprint at the 4 minute time point, so they were not completely rested for those 8 minutes. And again, that is an important distinction. So, what does all this mean, I guess, is the most important part? What are the practical implications? And maybe what is an explanation behind why post, post activation potentiation might increase sprint performance as a result of increasing peak power output? Well, first of all, we know from other literature, um, and I will be going into some of this literature in the coming weeks, that post-activation potentiation appears to increase motor unit recruitment. That basically means that when we talk about a motor unit, it includes the it includes sorry the, the nerve that stimulates a set amount of muscle groups as well as those muscle groups. So we're essentially recruiting more muscle, which means we're able to generate more power. We're also increasing motor unit synchronization, which means that more muscle groups are basically being activated at the same time point, allowing us or allowing each of those muscle groups to synchronize and contribute to the overall peak power output. Um, this is especially important in multi-joint movements when there's multiple muscle groups working across different joints trying to contribute to an overall movement. So increasing synchronization can improve power output and thus sprint performance in this case. We also see a decrease in presynaptic inhibition, which is essentially a decrease in the inhibition of the muscle groups that are going to act to increase peak power output and improve sprint performance. And we also see an increase in sarcoplasmic calcium levels. Now, if you don't know, um, I will go into more depth about this if people are interested, but calcium is extremely important for muscle activation. In fact, calcium is is one of the, the chemicals within the body that allows you to actually contract muscle. So when we get a release of sarcoplasmic calcium, it activates myosin light chain, which is part of the muscle fiber responsible for the actual contraction and shortening of the muscle. Once we get activation of this myosin light chain, we get an increase in cross bridging. And as this cross bridge process and multiples of this cross, pros, cross bridging process that allows the muscle to shorten, subsequently we see a muscle contraction. So there are four of the main reasons or suggestions as to why post activation potentiation might increase performance. Finally then, I guess, and the most important aspect of this video is what can you take away from this? Well, what you, we know is that post activation appears to be effective at increasing sprint performance specifically in professional rugby players, but potentially could be transferred into other sports and other well-trained athletes. What, the other thing we also know is that it must be individualized both in terms of the preload and recovery time. So although all athletes receive the same preload in this study, this may partly explain why not all athletes responded in a similar manner. So we know from other research that preload is extremely individualized. We can also know now that recovery time when trying to improve sprint performance via post activation potentiation is extremely individualized. Therefore, contrast training should be specific to the individual.